Hello, so this is going to be a video on my sword collection, and I'm only going to include proper swords in this and not um, sort of machetes that are made to be a bit more like swords. So there's saw, uh, four swords in here, so it's not a massive collection by any means, but hopefully people will find this video interesting. And the nice thing about this is most of these swords are kind of different categories of swords, so it's not like I've got loads of kind of similar medieval swords or whatever. So um, I'll just pan down and pan back up so you can see the sort of height of these. Um, but obviously you'll see them all in more detail when I actually show each one individually. So from left to right we have um, what's a Hanway slash Tinker Pierce. Um, they call it early medieval sword but it's basically an arming sword or a knightly sword is the term for these. Um, in the sort of medieval period where you have the two sort of famous um, kind of swords carried by nobility or... Um, sort of in aristocracy or whatever, you have the arming sword and the long sword. Um, the arming sword is the shorter one, the long sword is the longer one. Basically the long sword is longer, has a longer handle, and sort of a longer, narrower blade. The arming sword is a slightly fatter, shorter blade, um, designed for one-handed use. Um, then we have my falchion. Um, that was commissioned from Heron Armoury, um, a guy called Tim Noyes does those. Um, and that's very, very good. That's the favourite of my swords by far, but you also notice it's the shortest. Um, it's sort of a close quarters fighting sword. Um, they're very brutal and efficient. Then next we have the longest one, is a military rapier, an English swept hilt rapier by John Barnett. Now John Barnett has a bit of a mixed reputation for making crap swords. Um, I'll get onto that when I talk about this one, but I'm not actually disappointed with it at all. Um, and on the right we have a windless 1860 Sabre, um, it's a US style cavalry one. Um, I don't think they classified them in light or heavy cavalry Sabres because the US only had one type of cavalry at the time. So, US 1860 Sabre. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with the arming sword and I'll work my way through them and I'll show you them in more detail. Okay, so first up the arming sword. I'll show you the scabbards to each of these quickly as well. Um, this handway scabbard is pretty good, although it makes a bit of a grating noise when you pull the sword out. Um, it's sort of, I think it's wood wrapped in leather, then with um, metal at both ends. The only annoying thing about it is this top bit keeps coming out, so I've glued that in now. But um, after a while of me having the sword, every time I pulled it in and out, it would pull out the thing with it. Okay, so let's look at the blade. Now, out of all the swords, this is the one I've abused the most. So some of the things that have gone wrong with this is simply because I've had it the longest and I've abused it the most. Um, I'm pretty sure this is EN45 spring steel blade. Um, this bends and goes back to shape very, very efficiently, so that's good. In some of the videos where I'm actually wielding the sword, you'll be able to tell that. Now, on the handguard, you'll notice a bit of weird glue stuff. Um, that's me that's done that. Basically, what happened is um, this handguard shook loose. It's still a little bit wobbly here. Um, so what I did is I just basically got some um, like really strong industrial glue and put it in there. I didn't really care if it made the sword look a bit off because I want it for practical purposes. Um, also with the handguard, this was leather wrapped and the leather basically disintegrated so now I've just got like the twine stuff that's under the leather which I actually find more comfortable. Um, so yeah, I can't remember the length of this sword off the top of my head, I think it might be around 30 inch blade something, 32 inch blade something like that. Um, but yeah, this is a very um, practical sword if you like the sort of medieval ones. Now an actual long sword probably is a bit more efficient than this in terms of practicality as a sword especially because you've got the longer grip so you can you know wield it with two hands easier but this obviously when you build up the forearm strength to use it is quite practical now the problem with these swords um, is that obviously they are double-edged now double-edged swords aren't actually as good in my opinion um, which might be a bit controversial when I speak you speak to some people on here um, but simply because I find the swords optimized for swinging in one direction like sabers and the falchion um, are actually easier to learn how to use and probably cheaper to produce. But the arming sword is really nice. Um, Hanway are definitely high quality swords, no doubt about that. Um, I'd recommend these pretty much to anyone. Um, but yeah, this does rust easily though, so I've had to oil this lots of times and everything. Um, and you'll see a bit of rust damage on the sword I've never managed to get off. I think that adds to the character after a while. But yeah, this is a nice sword. Um, not loads I can say about it, but as I said, out of all the swords I've got, this is the one I've used and abused the most. So it's the one that I'm not surprised shows you know the most signs of um, being damaged. But yeah, as I said, swords like this were kind of an early medieval, uh, as I said, early medieval, 
this is kind of the one that predated the long sword because they thought why not make swords longer and more efficient. So that's exactly what this is, the precursor to the long sword. But in terms of hacking and stabbing people, it does that absolutely fine as you'd imagine. Not that I've tested it on people of course, but when I've used it on pumpkins and whatever else, even bits of wood, it's um, been pretty efficient at that. So. Next up, my falchion, and as I said, this is the favourite of my swords. Now, this didn't come with a scabbard, this is literally a cold steel gladius um, machete thing I've repurposed to put my falchion in. So, this is the falchion. So, what are falchions? Because I've done the videos on this before, and this is a long, interesting subject. So I'll try and condense it down a bit. Falchions were medieval swords primarily designed for slashing rather than thrusting, although they can, like this one, have a good point on for thrusting. If you were to get a falchion, I'd say always get one that's got a point on, because why not? Um, so obviously the primary use of falchion is, um, you know, chopping people with it. Now this is an English style falchion from around the 1400s, obviously it's a modern made one, but that's the period it's from. Um, the thing is, if you look, there's a quite good image you can find on Google sometimes about this that shows the evolution of some European swords. And the falchions started off a lot more cleaver-like and shorter, and then lots of them evolved into swords we call back swords or things like that. So. Um, this is a late generation falchion, almost to the point of a back sword, so it's a lot more elegant and refined. Um, it probably doesn't hack as well as some of the earlier falchions, but it's much better at thrusting and it's much nicer to hold because it's far more controllable. Now, the interesting thing with falchions is a shorter falchion tends to be about the same weight as a longer sword, like an arming sword or a long sword, simply because the falchion has a lot more mass in a much shorter package, which makes it good for, you know, hacking. Um, but yeah, this controls really well due to its short size and I'm not particularly tall. Um, you know, you can thrust with it well, and you can obviously, like I said, slash with it well. It's got the fighting handguard style thing on it that you can obviously punch with, um, gives your hands good protection, and it's got a sword trap on there, and the pommel's got a business end on it as well, so very, very nice. Um, as I said, Heron Armoury did this, um, absolute excellent workmanship, obviously it's going to cost you a lot more than just buying a factory made, well you know what I mean when I say factory made, like mass produced, even if it's by individual blacksmith style swords, like the other ones in this video. Um, yeah, so with falchions, because there was not a uniform design and they were made over a sort of 300 plus year period across Europe, the designs of falchions can vary massively. They always have some characteristics that make them falchions, primarily that they're designed for slashing and not stabbing. Falchions are pretty much always one-sided, I think that's one thing we can agree on. See, that is not a blade on that side, the blade is on this side. Um, so that's one of the things that, you know, defines a falchion is that it's always single-edged. Um, but well, I think some have a bit of a second edge coming up here, but you know, that only stops at the front. But falchions are primarily swords designed for slashing, but as I said, they were used all across Europe. Now, some falchions certainly evolved into sabres, um, particularly in Eastern Europe, where they became even longer and more curved. But basically, um, the falchion, you know, was used all across Europe, and it was quite, you know, varied wildly. So the thing you have to remember is in the medieval period there weren't factories that mass produced things where they all had blueprints so designs could vary a lot but then you get some like you know so-called history experts online that go no that's not a falchion because it's not however many grams or this exact length you know it's all stuff like that don't you know listen to people like that but this um one by heron armory is incredibly nice my favorite sword in my collection obviously it cost me the most but it's the one that's the most tailored for what i wanted Shorter than most of my swords, but easily the most controllable and fun to use. So there we go, the falchion. Okay, so next we've got the John Barnett military style rapier, or English swept hilt rapier is the official name for this. Let's put the scabbard out of the way. Now, my major complaint with this is not with the sword itself, but with the scabbard, because it leaves a lot of residue on the sword for some reason, I guess, because they put some cheap leather lining in it. Um, but the sword itself I really like. Um, it's on the heavy side. Um, this is about 1.5 kilos compared to like the higher quality rapiers made by other companies of the same size which are about 1 kilo to about 1.3 depending on the model and blade length and you know the hilt and everything else but this if you want something that's basically a wall hanger that you can abuse and it's not going to fall apart on you this is perfectly fine for that you know it thrusts well enough if you're going to thrust a bit obviously you can chop with this but the thing is with military style rapiers is the blade is not um, thick enough to actually chop well. So what they kind of designed for it, at least I'd imagine, is that you thrust with it and then when you thrust you pull it back and that's where the cut comes from. So, obviously its primary role is death by thrusting because that's what it's designed for. 
but I think rather than chopping like whoo, you know, like that with this because it's a big heavy sword, what you're actually going to be doing more with it is thrusting and then cutting as you pull back, or you know, cutting across as you do that. So I think you'd use this far more like you'd use it than a knife than the machete compared to some of the other swords. You know, it's actually primarily a thrusting sword, which then cuts on the draw rather than actually on the um, you know, like a chop. But yeah. So this is easily the heaviest of my swords, 1.5 kilos, it's the longest of my swords, the blades I think 39 or 40 inches. Um, again it's EN45 um, spring steel, so it's the exact same thing as a handway sword. Um, this looks like it could take a fair bit of abuse, all the things with, take careful not to take the ceiling out, um, all the things with the hilt and the uh, sword are well done. I definitely don't think anything on this is actually going to fall apart easily, you know. Although some people said, oh, John Barnett's sword is total crap. I think what you have to understand with a John Barnett sword is it's basically kind of a grade above a wall hanger. It's a practical wall hanger, if you want to call it that. Probably not very good for um, actual sparring with people or anything like that, but it's made well enough. And the thing you really need to remember is that if you actually look at the quality of real medieval swords that have survived, they were not good to quality metallurgy at all and things like that. Um, modern reproductions, if made to an okay standard, are far better than the original medieval swords, simply because we have much better metallurgy now, the machining processes and everything else. Um, so when people seem to think that, you know, um, modern swords are crap compared to medieval ones, probably not, um, you know, if you actually look at some, how much slag and stuff like that was in the blades of old medieval swords, they were not good at all, but they were working with the best they could do at the time. But Anyway, there we go. This is um, obviously the John Barnett Military Rapier, or English Swept Hilt Rapier, its official name. For the price you're going to pay for it, about £100, I think it's very nice. Um, again, like, this is certainly, I'd say, the lowest quality of all my swords, but it's not, you know, horrible low quality. It's um, you get what you pay for kind of quality. And for £100, I'm very happy with this, but, you know, again, it goes back to my Heron Armoury's falchion cost me over £400. Um, would that, just, to some people, would that justify four of these swords? Probably not. Um, you know, like the windlass ones are a bit more expensive and the handway ones are again around the £200 mark. So it really depends what you want and what you want to pay for, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, I don't think for, a, if you're paying around £100 for a John Barnett sword, I think they're really great for that. You know, I'm not going to complain at that. Because there are people, of course, like I've said, that will buy something that's really cheap, know it's really cheap, and then moan that it's cheap and doesn't have the features of a much more expensive product. But anyway, a bit more of the history of these swords. Um, after the medieval period, when we're getting into the Renaissance, armour was a lot less widespread because you have obviously have muskets becoming more popular and things like that, things that can shoot straight through armour. So why wear heavy armour when it's not going to give you lots of protection? So that's why swords were developed that were primarily designed for thrusting or cutting. Um, not ones that had to crush through armour or anything like that. So a rapier is a very simple to the point, thrust, you're dead kind of sword. Um, because obviously a blade like this doesn't need much force to go through a person if they're not wearing armour. Okay, and last it's the windless 1860 sabre, the US style cavalry one. So let's get the blade out of there, put the scabbard down. So, as you can see, this is a cavalry sabre. It's obviously primarily designed for uh, chopping like that. Slashing. You can thrust of a saber, but not very well. Um, it never goes where you think it's going to go to a point, because obviously it's a curved sword. If I hold it at an angle like this, you can probably see how big the curve is. You certainly can if you look along the blade. Um, if I do it from that angle, it might be more obvious. Yeah, you can see there how curved the blade is. But obviously a curved blade means that you get more force onto a smaller area when you're uh, slashing with it. So for cavalry, that's very important. So you could obviously fight um, dismounted with these, but uh, primarily they're uh, used from horseback to slash down on people. Now, um, like I was saying, the rapier is kind of the epitome of a sword designed for thrusting. This is the epitome of a, or like, you know, the end product of a sword designed for slashing. It's a curved blade um, that's, you know, quite long and essentially thin. Um, the falchion, if you compare them side by side, is a much thicker blade than this. At least as you get further up, but the obviously the saber is um, much longer. Now, I've not had lots of uh, practice swinging this around yet, but it does handle quite nicely once you build the forearms up to actually, you know, wield a sword more efficiently.
but primarily it is, you know, for chopping. I guess you guard like that and then bring it across. I'm like trying to take the, not take the camera out, you know, now. That's the thing. <laughs> but, <clears throat> yeah. It's, um... I quite like this, like I said, for um, a sword that, for, this is from Seven Swords of the Windless uh, Saber, and the um, Han, not Hanway, the um, John Barnett Rapier was from Seven Swords. This one was, I think, with the price of having it sharpened and postage, only just over £150. So £150 for this is excellent. Um, it is very sharp, because I obviously paid to have the sharpening service done on it. Um, you know, that would do a lot of uh, damage if brought down on a person. But, yeah, this is just basically an American cavalry sabre from around the period of the American Civil War. Lots of the European sabres um, are obviously very similar design to this. Um, simple and effective, really. You know, you've got a decent handguard on there to protect your hand. Um, but primarily, it is just used to slash people. And because during the 1800s, uh, regular soldiers did not wear armour. They wore just, you know, uh, cloth, basically, or wool. Um... You know, something like this would go through them pretty effectively. So, that's the Cavalry Sabre. Um, you know, like I said, it's pretty much when you take a slashing sword to its end design, you get something like this. Um, when you take a thrusting sword to its end design, you get something like the Rapier. And then the medieval swords are much more, um, you know, jack-of-all-trade swords, which in some ways makes them better. If I had to fight with any of these, I'd always choose my Falchion, just because I think it's the most controllable and well-made of all the swords. Um, and probably the most forgiving. But again, this is only single-edged as well. There's no blade on the back edge. Um, yeah, I was checking, because some sabres have a bit of a blade as well there, but this one doesn't. Um, but, yeah, so US 1860 sabre by Windless Steelcraft. Uh, very good. Windless stuff seems very good for the low price of it. It's considered low-end on the grade of swords, but, you know, for the money it's pretty good if you just want something to hack stuff up in your garden with. So there you go, US 1860 Sabre. Um, yeah, that's nice. So anyway, that's my sword collection. As I said, only four swords, but you know, it's all quite interesting in my opinion.